This is your place for all things Grand Rapids Griffins and all things Toledo Walleye. This is the Hockey Town West Podcast with your host, Brandon Cook and Nick Harrington. And welcome back to the Hockey Town West Podcast, your source for everything Grand Rapids Griffins and Toledo Walleye Hockey. I am one of your hosts, Brandon. I'm Nick. And I'm Travis. And we are thrilled to be joined by one of the boys from the Wing Wheel Podcast tonight. We got Ryan Hanna on the show to do our Griffins season preview with us. So Ryan, thank you, man. Welcome to the show. Thank you, boys. And I appreciate you doing me the grace of not telling everyone that I was an hour late to this. So uh, just so you guys know, I've kept these guys up really late and I owe them one. So really appreciate your, your flexibility, but happy to be on the show. If Ryan only knew how late I was usually up editing this show, he'd realize this is nothing. This is nothing. But no, thank you for coming on. We're excited to jump into this. The Griffins obviously kick action off. This episode's coming out Friday morning-ish. So tonight, the Griffins kick off action. But there's been some news this week that we got to cover before we jump into the season preview here. And the first one was kind of a question that we had in our last episode is what's going to go on with the goalie situation with Jack Campbell going into the player assistance program. And the Griffins answered it by signing Malcolm Subban to a PTO, which I thought was an interesting move. I thought we were kind of going to roll with the Sebastian Kosa carter Guylander combo maybe to see what happens. But they clearly want a veteran in the room with Kosa. So I want to get your guys' thoughts on that. Ryan, I'm going to go to you first. Yeah, it just, to me, it was, you know, you have to react to the unpredictable and unfortunate situation with Jack Campbell going into the player assistance program. To that end, all you can really say to that is as someone who's covering the team is, you know, you wish him well. And by design, these programs are are made in such a way where I don't really think we're meant to speculate on why they're there. It's just that he's there and you don't really have a timeline as to when he's going to come out. So you wish the best for for Jack and his family. But yeah, with with Malcolm Subban, it's just bringing in a veteran presence. Whether he sticks or not, you know, you'll see. But I think you don't want to go in only having the option of two young guys. Uh, you guys will know full well the value of a veteran goalie, a stabilizing force. I, Sebastian Kosa doesn't get to where he was last season without some kind of stability and the ability to kind of not be in net on any given night. You know, as long as there's a steadying force there. So between him and Carter Guylander, yeah, you can call Kosa been there, done that, and and more of a steadying force, but he still has a long way to go. And and we want him to be a Detroit Red Wing sooner rather than later. And and you don't want to mess with that. So all Malcolm Subban is and in my mind is insurance. It might work out, it might not, but you, you want to give yourself the option and it's a cheap option to give yourself. Yeah, it's really cheap. And one of our friends who covers the Cleveland Monsters made sure to remind us that he's really good at beating teams that he used to play for. So that get, bodes well for when we play the Monsters this season. Nick, I know you you looked into Subban a little bit. You were the one that got to do the announcement that day for us. What's your thoughts? Yeah, so he also played for Rockford for a little bit. So, I mean, we play Rockford quite a bit. Uh, that's our biggest rival, as you can see in our division. So uh, that should be good news for us. Uh, you know my thing it's always balance right so we've got three goalies in detroit we got three goalies in grand rapids we got three goalies in toledo i mean steve likes to have his options i guess um i'm super excited to have pk or sorry pk pk's brother um on the team because he last year if i'm not mistaken he was an all-star goalie for the ahl he was at the all-star game um he's got great numbers it gives him that veteran presence like we talked about on the last show is this is kind of a weird spot for Kosa to be coming into mentoring a younger guy. And then you turn around and we have Malcolm now on the team. So uh, I like the stability. And the other thing that I like, well, one of his stats was 62 penalty minutes in the AHL. <laughs> so he's a, he's a rough uh, kind of feisty goalie. So I like that aspect to be able to bring that. And we kind of saw a little bit of that with Kosa last season of uh, getting a little aggressive with people getting too close to him in the crease and things like that. So uh, I'm thrilled to have him on the team, and uh, it's it's crazy to throw a goalie in at the, the week of the season, just like last year, but we roll with the punches, you know, control what you can control. Yeah, that was the joke all offseason so far, is we're not going to have to do that, and here we are, but it's going to work out, and I, I like to pick up, and like, that feistiness is fun. We did see Kosa do that a lot, Trav. You saw that a lot in Toledo as well. He, he gets up in people's faces. He likes to stick up for his teammates and defend his crease. So that'll be fun to have. And of course, there's two other additions now to Grand Rapids and Justin Hole clearing waivers and being assigned here and Austin Watson clearing waivers and being assigned here. Ryan, what are your thoughts on this whole situation here? Because this is, this is all craziness to us. 
The Justin Hall one was, I think, the move everyone could see coming from a mile away. It's just math. You know, unfortunately, that deal was uh, a non-starter for the Red Wings pretty much right away. And coming into this season, especially, you look at what the Red Wings needed on the right side, and he wasn't the solution to that. Did he have an opportunity to to earn a spot in camp? Sure, but he would have needed a, a remarkable performance, and he just wasn't that. So it all went as we thought it would in, in July, pretty much. And so Hall was waived. No one's going to claim him at two more years at $3.4 million per year. That's usually the kind of thing you have to give up a high-round pick for. So he waived and was assigned down, and that is both a roster move and a little bit of a money clearing moves so the Red Wings save 1.15 million on the cap that's the max you can save uh for for bearing uh salary through waivers but for the AHL side not bad like that is a Justin Hall is is fine as a 6-7 defenseman he's just overpaid and yeah I would say a lot of nights below replacement level and on his best nights he's just kind of you don't notice him but for the AHL that can be really good it's a it's a different game you can get away with a little bit more in terms of how you move on the ice and you have some more time to make decisions and you don't have uh, the kind of skilled entries that you have in the NHL. Your your errors don't burn you as much. So that's a pretty big boon for for the Griffins, I feel. You talk about the steadying force in net. I think a steadying force in the blue line is huge. And having lost you know, Edmondson and Johansson, though they're on the other side of the ice, it's still nice to have someone like Hall coming in to, to replace that. So that's kind of a nice bonus as unfortunate as the hall situation is for the red wings it's a complete 180 in my mind for the griffins it at the very worst it can't hurt the watson one is interesting so watson signed a a two-way deal which doesn't affect waivers at all it's just about how much money he makes uh which is going to be relevant in a second here he wanted a one-way deal yeah i think austin watson viewed himself as a veteran nhl player who's kind of been around the block earned his keep he's no slouch in terms of production for his kind of enforcer role either so uh, i think that's why he was gunning for the one way but the reality is he was late into camp he didn't get any offers from anywhere else for a one way and so he ultimately i guess just kind of accepted what was in front of him which was a two-way deal now why that's important is that if the red wings chose to send him down after clearing waivers which he did because no one was going to sign him anyways that means he makes a different salary in the ahl compared to the NHL, which sucks for Watson, but also, you know, when the Red Wings bury him down there, he doesn't count on their daily salary cap calculation without doing math at 10.30 p.m. Uh, I Just this NHL salary cap is calculated daily, and so if you have cap space on your roster, you accrue that daily. And so the Red Wings are going to keep him down there until they feel they need him. They have their 12 forwards. They have the Copras fisher line, the valeno Bergren mott line. Those are their bottom six. And unless something changes in terms of they need a little bit of a physical edge or someone gets hurt or, you know, Berggren's not really working out or whatever it is, you're probably going to see Watson down there until they need him. So that's why. Uh, and then once you waive someone and they clear, you have 30 days of eligibility to to move them unless they play more than 10 NHL games in that span. But we're getting into cap hella blue there. So again, that doesn't hurt for the Griffins either. I think... You're never going to complain about having an Austin Watson type. What the benefit is, really, I, I don't know if he's as big of an impact as Hall. I, I think you just have to see the makeup of the team. With the forwards, you're obviously more excited about the immense amount of talent that I think the Griffins have. But you're never going to complain about having a guy, a, an NHL pro body, come in. And if he needs to put some people you know, onto the ice, he can do that a lot more easily in the AHL. I agree with that. Travis, where do you think Austin Watson fits into this lineup right now with the Grand Rapids Griffins? I really want to see him play with Hunter Johannes. <laughs> like, I just think that would be a good group, like a good uh, another winger to put him with. Now, who plays center there? That's to be determined. But um, I think he kind of knows he's probably either the first call up, second call up. I mean, obviously, everybody thought Marco had a shot at the roster this year, but I definitely could see where Watson's, like Ryan said, first call up, but it's probably only going to be on like an emergency basis for now. Um, because even if a guy did get hurt, they could go eleven and seven until you find out severity of injuries and so on and so forth. But I don't I wouldn't say he'll probably play on the top line. I would say he's probably gonna play in the role that he would play with Detroit. I don't know, Ryan, if you would agree with me there or not, but um just something that I think you're gonna want to put him in a role that he's gonna play in Detroit, I would think. The thing that I find interesting too is he hasn't played a whole lot of AHL time and the team that he did, it was with Milwaukee, <laughs> who's our, 
her other rival as well. So I don't know if that's going to help create an edge or uh, an advantage on that end. But I think Travis, you're right on with that. Is that seeing him play with Hunter Johannes is going to be fun. Uh, that physical beat him up goon line. You know, I don't know who else we can put on that line out here at the moment. Uh, I mean, that's probably for another episode to be able to find up lineups. But uh, I think that could be could kind of interesting. A, a veteran to be able to help Hunter's uh, development as well. Yeah, no, you talk about like Milwaukee and you think of Rockford. Now there's a guy that for sure can deal with the presence of Zach LaRue and Wyatt Kaiser and all those guys who were thorns in our side last season and will probably be this season. And it's it's nice to have that insurance back there that's going to help protect all this young talent that is on the ice in Grand Rapids. I do want to pivot away from Grand Rapids a little bit, though, and head down to Toledo, actually, because we found out something this week with the walleye that I didn't see coming we talked about it in the past the walleye haven't had a full-time goalie coach at that level it's pretty common in the echl that they don't have one uh even when sebastian Cosa was down there we did see a lot of the red wings goalie brass spend a lot of time in toledo but there was no bona fide coach down there and that's changed this year they hired a guy named austin kaiser from atlanta he was, worked with the atlanta gladiators for the past couple seasons as a part-time goalie coach but now he's a full-time hired on goalie coach in the echl which when we look at it and we have prospects like Jan Bednar down there and potentially Carter Guylander in the future here, that really puts me in like a, a sense of ease when I think about our goalies down there. They were kind of just learning on the fly, and now we actually have a coach down there with them. I just kind of wanted to pick your brain on this, Ryan. What does it mean to see Detroit Red Wings invest in the ECHL like this as a development league, truly? I think it's a cascade effect from what we've seen, right? Like, who do the Red Wings have at goaltender once the Jimmy Howard era came in, like Howard came in on the heels of some pretty prolific goaltenders before him. Some worked out in Detroit. You think of, you know, Dominic Hasek, which I, I think pound for pound is the greatest goaltender of all time. And some of them didn't because they came in their later years and just whatever. But the, the Red Wings all time goalie list, it's not like it's grown over the last decade. And this whole pipeline being solved now is good, but it's still early stages. None of these guys have turned into NHLers yet, and you can't just bank on, oh, okay, Coast is great, and so we're going to stop there. No, you still have, you know, Augustine. You still have Guylander. You're still drafting goaltenders mostly every year, and the success at the NHL level does not happen unless you build it in the lower leagues. Rupe Koisinen was, from everyone I've talked to in the Red Wings and Griffins organization, they love him. You know, Dan Watson came on the our live show when we did it in Grand Rapids on the Winged Wheel Pod, and he was he was laughing because they always announce his name really uh, emphatically in the arena. He's like, that's BS. Like, <laughs> Rupe. He's like, why do they do his so dramatic and everyone else is so standard? But in all honesty, like they sing his praises. And to me, I think they see the success with Koistin and they see how Kosa progressed and you saw Kosa's progression. It's not like he's a talented goaltender right off the bat. He had to kind of build that. And they thought, you know what? You, you can't just start this when they get to the AHL. If you have Carter Guylander or anyone else down in Toledo, like, these are programs where you need to start to build this support. Also, you look at Derek Lalone's connection to Toledo, like absolutely that pipeline, those connections going backward, you know his influence is in there as well. And he's going to say like these resources are well placed down in the ECHL, even though it's far separated from, from the Red Wings and at the LCA, like that that's going to pay dividends in the future. So it's just a smart investment and good for them. I think they was Koisinen's impact last year was, was really felt and, Hopefully that continues at the lower levels. Yeah, I agree. Travis, are you excited with being a walleye fan? Obviously first that you're going to have a goalie coach down there this year. I think it's exciting. It's um, a new wrinkle for the goaltenders. They get coaching every day that they probably weren't getting in the past. I mean, obviously it sounded like Kosa got a lot of attention when he was in Toledo with it being so close to Detroit, but um you know, it's like Ryan said, you got to kind of build this from the basement up at the same time you're drafting goaltender every year. Um, and it seems like the ECHL has become the place where goaltending prospects kind of start their career. If you were drafted later, um, you see it a lot when a lot of teams come to Toledo that, you know, these guys all like they're they have masks that are painted for American League teams or NHL teams like they've been drafted and now they get to develop at that level. and. For Toledo, I mean, you get to put two kids with a signified like coach that's going to be with them, working with them every single day. And then you can also add like an element of like, okay, you get to take shots from Brandon Hawkins every day. Like 
I don't know, Ryan, if you know how good of a player Brandon Hawkins is, but his shot is NHL worthy. Like it's crazy. But I think that's the biggest advantage you have a guy working with them every single day to make them better for their long term career. Yeah, and that was one thing that was hit on too. And we spoke with John Lettman in the offseason. He was like, you know, after Coast left, it did kind of dissipate down there with the attention that they got. So it is good to see that. And yeah, I'm I'm really excited for it. And Mark Monroe, our friend of the show, works for the Toledo Blade, did confirm that's the only ECHL team with a full time goalie coach. So that's a crazy stat right there. And Travis, you might be able to correct me, but I thought this guy was a volunteer coach all last season. So I don't know how much time he was actually like there working with the goalies. But I mean, I think this is huge. I mean, my time with the Red Wings, like watching them, it was always we were trading for goalies. It was Curtis Joseph. We were, you know, signing these big free agents or trading for them like Dominic Hasek, Chris Osgood. Like these guys were all being brought in. It wasn't people that were in our pipeline already. And so I just don't want to go back to a 22-23 season where we've got eight goalies that we're rotating through on a consistent basis of who's who's in net tonight kind of thing. So I like to be able to have the the development there and the pipeline growing, uh, even extending out to Toledo. So I think that's it's huge for the organization on, on that end. Yeah. Uh, moving on to the last thing before we jump into the season preview side of things. Uh, there was a quote that floated around Twitter today from Sean Shapiro, as Ryan Hanna knows. Sean Shapiro pretty well. Part of the Expected by Whom podcast. Uh, it was a quote that I think a lot of people took a bunch of different ways. Just kind of want to get your guys' quick opinions on it, though. It was from Jonathan Berggren on, you know, MBN wanting to play in the SHL. And in Berggren's view, the SHL brings value as it puts uh, an environment where winning is still important, where he views the AHL as success is not the priority. And a lot of people took it a million different ways. Ryan, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I thought it was interesting too. I, I don't think it was like this massive kind of disagreement between players camp and teams camp that maybe it was interpreted to be. I think some things were lost in translation, but I still think it's pretty notable for, for you know, a kid to come in, a team to say, hey, we just drafted you high up in this draft. We think you're not far away from being NHL ready. And we think if you spend some time in the AHL, you're really going to challenge for a spot as soon as next season. And then for him to say, I feel comfortable getting ready for that in the SHL. Like that's not nothing. One, that's an interesting dynamic with the team. I think the team is okay with it. You have to take them at their word when they say ultimately it's his choice. And I don't think that's just because they like to cede control. That's not really Steve Eisman's style. But I think it's because they know the value of... Uh, a player being comfortable as a person, as a human being. There are many, many cases of guys who are excellent hockey players, all the skill in the world. They have all the mental they need on the ice. But if they don't feel like they have a place in where they're living full time, it's a very difficult thing. And it's not really something fans can empathize with because we watch from our living rooms. We live where, we, where we're from for the most part. We're not watching from you know, uh, we're going to Fro Lunda to watch Red Wings games. It's just not how it works. And so these guys, it's it's so hard to conceptualize what they're going through. And there's sometimes more of a language barrier than others. So the Red Wings recognize that and they know you can't torch a guy's development if he's really not feeling it. But, you know, he still made that decision. The AHL, like the Griffins are a really great AHL program. They're a reputable AHL program. The Red Wings are a great organization. They have support top to bottom this isn't like latter stage arizona coyotes so he had to have really believed in you know what he was going to get in sheleftia and the kind of team he was going to play on so i i think ultimately the red wings were comfortable with that kind of thing because they have a great support system in sweden they're going to be able to keep a close eye on him i think you know they've had successes out of the shl multiple they just paid two of them quite a bit of money uh, so it's not really like uh, they are going to go there and suck that it's not it at all. Um, and so I, I think at the end of the day, it's just a different decision. And is it going to make him a worse player? I don't think so. Is he going to have a worse time developing? I don't think so. Is he going to be a different experience? Yeah, absolutely. And what that ultimately translates into, we'll see. But you can't really fault him for saying what he said, though. Like in the SHL, you're going to win championships. In the AHL, as Sean really uh, well wrote in, on his Shap Shots uh, substack, which I encourage you to read. It's the AHL. You're trying to win, of course. Trying to win the Calder Cup, but a, an NHL GM will say their AHL program is successful if they churned out prospects into NHL players. Yeah. 
No, I, I agree with that take. And, you know, like you said, we just paid two guys that came out of the SHL straight to the Red Well, not, well, one went straight to the Red Wings. We paid them a lot of money and they're very talented players. I mean, look what Raymond did coming out of just one year over there. So I have all the faith in the world that this is going to be okay. It does suck for us because we probably won't see much of MBN in Grand Rapids is what that confirms. Maybe we'll see him for a playoff run this year, but I think that's, uh, that's about all we'll see. He'll probably skip that step. But Nick, you had some thoughts you want to add? I mean, that's the perfect player to compare him to based off this path is Lucas Raymond. I mean, Lucas spent the two years in Frolunda and then came over and he skipped Grand Rapids completely. So I'm kind of seeing this more of that path. And we, we've we been wishy-washy on if he's going to be here, if he's going to be with the Wings or Grand Rapids. So, I mean, at the end of the day, it makes sense. And he's, you gotta remember, he's 18 years old. Like <laughs> like Ryan said, it's you got to adjust to a new language, a new city, a new everything in three months like that that's tough for a kid and parents as well so uh good for, you know he's gonna get the development we've got wings guys over there to be able to help coach and to keep eyes on him and help him continue to develop and that that team's a good team so yep it's gonna be interesting to watch i'm happy that our flow sports subscription that the griffins will be on this year also now includes the shl so that's a positive we'll get to see more action from him on there at least when we can actually catch games even though they're super early in the morning most of the time for us but I, it's going to be fun to watch and him being with asp it's going to be a lot of fun for everybody to see those highlights so looking forward to that i think now what we'll do is send it to a quick ad break and when we come back we'll jump into the griffin season preview here and get ryan's thoughts on all things griffins one for it so nick go read the ad the quest for the Stanley Cup starts now. The puck's dropping on the 24-25 season. Get in on all of the action at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL. Super easy for the first-timers to get started. Try betting on something simple like picking a team to win. Go to the DraftKings Sportsbook app, select your team, and place your first bet. With the Red Wings opening the season on Thursday, October 10th, the current line is Detroit Red Wings, a minus 130 on the money line. Odds and lines are subject to change between now and then. And if you are new to draft, Kings, listen up. New customers bet five bucks to get two hundred dollars in bonus bets instantly. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code THPN. That's code THPN for new customers to get two hundred dollars in bonus bets when you bet just five bucks. Only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call one eight hundred Gambler in New York. Call seven seven eight Hope NY. Text Hope NY four six seven three six nine eight Connecticut. Help is available for problem gambling. Call eight 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 seven eight nine seven 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 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, Kansas. Twenty one plus eight eligibility varies by jurisdiction void in ontario bonus best expire 168 hours after issuance for additional terms of responsible gaming resources ctkng.co slash ice copyright nhl 2024 all rights reserved and we're back all right jumping into this preview here we've talked all off season at least we have about what the griffins kind of look like the addition subtractions what we expect but really here to pick ryan's brain on most of this stuff so ryan i'm gonna throw the first thing over to you what do you feel is the biggest additions that the griffins have made so far in this off season coming into this season well, I mean, I would say that you guys are the pros better than me. Uh, it's really hard, honestly, like when I think about this, the, the Griffins this season to not consider the fact that they lost uh, Edmonton and Johansson first. Like that's what always comes to mind. But for them to get a full season of Nate Danielson, I wasn't sure that was going to be the case. Uh, before camp and when we saw Casper really shined in, in camp for the Red Wings this year, before camp, I thought, man, Danielson, I think, is the best poised to do this. I thought he had a really great preseason, two preseasons ago. And so I really thought he had a good chance of making the Red Wings right out of camp. The way the roster was constructed, maybe I shouldn't have considered that as as too likely. But I think Nate Danielson is going to be a really interesting addition, especially if you don't see a ton of Marco Casper over the course of the year, because, you know, if he gets called up on first injury or something. So it's a very Red Wings centric perspective. Uh, but I do look at Nate Danielson and think is it the exact player that you lost in Marco Casper no but I do think he can be more of a dynamic player than people can appreciate and I think that is a massive massive addition and then also boring it is a boring answer but if they have a full season of Justin Hall like you guys watch the AHL a ton like that can pay dividends in terms of standings points right like when we try to explain to people who don't really tune into the AHL what makes a good AHL team why like why are teams who are loaded with future stars, like NHL stars in their roster, sucking in the AHL near the bottom of the standings? It's just not the way the AHL works. It is a pro league full of grown ass men who are uh, excellent hockey players and much more matured and developed. So I think having Justin Hall there can be a steadying force. But yeah, the the most predictable answer in the world. But I really like 
kind of a full season Nate Danielson. And, and frankly, like if you get Carter Mazur and Marco Casper for any appreciable amount of time there, we're going to sound like Ken Holland here, but like the return to them is our trade deadline acquisition kind of thing, right? Like, were you expecting to have them back? I'm, I'm not sure everyone was. So that, that's got to be nice for Dan Watson and his crew. Yeah, we were not expecting to have all three of those players that you mentioned there, Nate, Carter, and Marco. I was expecting one of them to be gone, but to have all three to start, that's insane. Uh, and I do agree that Justin Holt thing, I look back at acquiring Radim Shimmick when Kostin got traded, and everyone was kind of like, who is this guy? And he came in there and he filled the Simon Edmondson role perfectly, and that veteran presence that we needed back there was filled. So Justin Hole can fit that mold and, you know, William Lagason as well being an addition down here, I think will be another good one on the back end. Um, and obviously you hinted at it. The biggest loss is there. We do lose Albert Johansson and Simon Edmondson, but I wanted to just pick Nick's brain. Now that we know everything is set on the blue line back there, this is your biggest concern for the offseason was the blue line. We know who we have for right now. Are you feeling any more confident in the Griffins defense with those two losses? I mean, I'm glad Ryan said our biggest addition was Justin Hole. So I was uh, <laughs> I was super stoked for that one. Um, I I still like until we see him. It's the chemistry that's the biggest thing. I mean, I know Justin Hole is going to come in and he's going to be able to do his thing. Um, but I still like we we talked uh, Dello. We didn't see much during preseason, so I'm not sure where he fits. I, I'm not sure of these lineups. So, like we were just kind of going back through what preseason and training camp look like for pairings and. They were all over the place, so I I still don't know, and they and they probably will be throughout the season too, until we kind of figure out where we are, who we have, and who matches up well with each other. So, I mean, I'm still, I'm still concerned. I guess it's a valid concern, Travis. Overall, I know you didn't get too into the Griffins last year until you met us, and then we kind of sucked you right into the Grand Rapids scene here. Do you overall think that this team looks better on paper this year? I think they're deeper, especially up front. Add additions of Snively and Drys was going to help them out a lot. And I, I, I'm not going to lie, I really like to Justin Hall to Grand Rapids. I think the stability he's going to provide. Like I said the other night, if and I don't know, Ryan, if you want to jump in and have any thoughts on this, but I said the other day, like Justin Hall at maybe half the price is probably not in Grand Rapids, like. I just my opinion. I mean, um, you'd save a couple if you save about a million dollars on the cap, maybe a little more. He's maybe in Detroit, who knows? But he's here, so it's like Dan Watson said, you know, we got to get these guys to want to play here where they're at currently. And I think all these guys are gonna do a great job with that. Um, if you can get the next step from 2 0 and Wally, I think you're gonna see um just a good all-around team that ultimately could be a contender in the AHL, I think. Yeah. Moving on from just the additions to subtractions, this is where I really wanted to pick Ryan's brain. I have a couple of prospects listed that I just want to know your thoughts on what they need to do to take that next step throughout the season in Grand Rapids and what their NHL potential is as it stands for you right now. The first guy I'm going to go to is Nate Danielson, obviously. So we'll start there. What are you thinking? Yeah, with Nate Danielson, I think his his abilities have been appreciated every step of the way since the organization took him when they were you know taking Nate Danielson they knew that they were going to take flack from people who thought well the production's not really there especially at the WHL level and someone right in the organization told me right away it was like you know go watch this kid actually watch him and tell me then if you have the same opinion and you saw that when he got traded in the WHL he was with teammates who could actually convert on opportunities and the production started to come so i don't think they're at all concerned about his his offensive dynamism i think you know rounding out a pro game is a easy generic answer for anyone at that level they're looking for him to add a little bit of the frame the resilience the ability to hang with the beats and bumps of a full pro season in north america whether ahl or, or the nhl like I, I have no doubt nate danielson can come hang in a few games in the nhl and look like not the 12th best red wings forward but probably better but can he do that over a stretch of a season? That's that's the difference between guys who make the team and guys who just kind of spot fill. And so they want to see him get you know used to the physicality, used to the pace, and continue to fill out just a little bit. I think the feeling that he's a little bit closer to 
you know, a, a prospect out of the WHL than an NHL ready prospect in their mind. So that's what they want to see from him. And then, of course, you want to see his offensive abilities translate into the the AHL level. Like you want to see that production there. And we all know the kind of defensive stalwart he can be. Connor Bedard says he was the hardest player to he played against when he was in the CHL. So that to me is kind of a given. But of course, you want to see that continue to grow. But yeah, with Nate Danielson, it's like, all right, let's let's grow into an NHL ready frame here. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, the next guy is a guy who showed out in preseason. I think showed us all that a late round pick could uh, make some noise in a lot of ways. And Amadeus Lombardi, what do you kind of expect to see from him this season? And the same question about you know what's he need to do to get to that next step? Yeah, I, I think Lombardi is a fun one, man. Like he he was probably drafted later than he would have been if not for COVID. So the Red Wings probably have some found money there. He I he was impressive to me for a guy who's not. Like he's not talking about an NHL frame. Like he's slight. Like he's he's feels like a kid playing on the ice, but he's so talented. And I think that kind of thing can find a spot on the Red Wings. He just has to continue to take a big step in his development, both physically and you know how he translates on the ice. I mean, you guys know how he kind of goes through the course of an AHL season better than than anyone else, really. But I, I don't think it's unfair to say they want to see him be able to handle again the physicality the the pace the time and space you have when you're a really dynamic offensive player not that it's easy to do at lower levels but that kind of time and space goes away at the nhl so they want to continue to see him work on that and for someone with his offensive ability they want to see him take over at the ahl level to know that at the nhl level he can be something because he doesn't have all the tools that nate danielson has for example but you think about a kind of guy who can be a, an offensive weapon on your power play for example or come in your lineup and not be a, a net negative on the ice, then I think Lombardi has a shot to do that. Yeah, I think when he was on the show this past season, we had talked with him about, you know, what was his focus? And it was just adjusting to the pro level. He wasn't looking to go out there and blow the doors off with points. And I think that conversation with him will probably change a little bit this year. I think he's going to have a lot higher expectations on himself. And he really did show what he could do offensively in this preseason as well. I know Nick and I are both very excited to cover him for a full season here. So I have, a, I have a question for you, Ryan. This has been a big argument on the show is do you find him being more on a center for the Red Wings or more on the wing? Oh, I love that question. <laughs> I, I like if I was able to accurately predict, you know, which centers would translate as centers, I would not come on podcast. I'd sell it to Steve Eisman for a million bucks. Um, and he'd probably just beat the hell out of me for it for free. But the logic dictates wing is more likely. And that's just like a, a of maybe a frame thing but i still think it's too early to tell brain pace and the ability to not get knocked off the puck i think are, are probably what are the earliest indicators of uh, of who's going to stay as a center but those are really broad generalizations and you have guys who can outskate you know any deficiencies in hockey iq and you have guys who think the game so well but skate like tyler bertuzzi when he's hung over and they're stay, still able to do it so i'm not going to say he has to be like 63 Henry Cavill clone who who skates well and is uh, you know as smart as you four but you three I was looking at myself on the screen very obviously I'm not a center um I, I think I most likely wing but I wouldn't rule out the center position I like it um next guy I think he gets forgotten about right now and he shouldn't be based on how he ended last season Elmer Soderbaum where do you where are you thinking he's at right now and is the potential still there yeah, wow! I get yelled at a lot about Elmer Soderblom, like a lot. The Swedes really like Swed Swedish fans are passionate, man, and you love them for it. But if you if you met like don't mention a Swede enough, like you'll hear it. Soderblom is interesting, right? Like he made the Red Wings at a camp, blew everyone away with how good he was, and you know for a dozen games or whatever it was, you're like, wow, this is uh, what a revelation, what a find, and it's not like he. The, the floor fell out from beneath him, but kind of, you know, he got injured. He had trouble keeping up with the pace of the game. He had trouble keeping up with the physicality, and, and that was both in the game and in practice. And the Red Wings were like, you know, you really need to kind of refine this. And I don't think they saw him take over in the SHL or in the AHL right away or often enough, or they saw the kind of steps they needed from him. So, is he still a good prospect in the wing system? I say yes. And is the door closed on him? Absolutely not. 
on a Red Wings team, you know, five years ago or when they sucked a lot more and there were a lot more roster spots, well, then a lot of these prospects are making the team way earlier. And then maybe you, you're talking about Soderblom filling in the 13th, 12th, 13th forward spot. But on this team, it's it's just hard. You'd have to see him take a, a big leap and bound this year. And I'm a big believer that you don't, you can take trends, you can take generalizations, but never pigeonhole a player in a certain spot as a certainty. I think people take that way too far and we forget no two prospects are the same. The trends would dictate that if if Soderblom didn't have his opportunity and he wasn't able to break in now, how much are you really going to see a player of that archetype change? I I think a likely outcome, unless he really changes things this season, is that he's just a fringy, you know, maybe call up a bit guy, but really just a fan favorite and yet uh, AHL kind of person. But you never know if he, he he is able to use his frame and his offense and his skills more assertively in the AHL this year. Then maybe he changes that narrative. But he has a lot of competition around him now. Like no one's complaining. I, it's going to sound mean, but. You look at what everyone's up in arms about right now. It's Casper, and if it's not Casper, it's Danielson. If it's not Danielson, it's Mazur. Like he's he's not at the top of that list, and he's not in the top three. I don't think. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. I will say the one things that I, uh, a couple of things I noticed that he improved on from last season. I think all three of us agree. His skating got dramatically better during this off season, and the physicality is starting to finally come out more. We saw it last season. We saw Hunter Johannes trying to pull it out of him in the red and white game, being all over him. And you saw it a couple of times in preseason, but if he can somehow bring that all full circle into his game this year, he'll have a big year in the AHL, but can he crack that ceiling? That's up to him, I guess. That is the best way to put it. Um, a guy I want to throw a curveball at you here and see how, see if you got to catch much of him in the preseason at all. And Antti Tuomisto, it's a defenseman that we kind of forget about with William Volander still being back there. And obviously Johansson and Edmondson being here. But Auntie's still back there, and he played first line in Grand Rapids for the majority of the season with Simon Edmondson last year. What do you want to see from him this year with the Griffins to maybe be a guy that might be next on the radar? Tomiso's an interesting one as well. You look at his abbreviated contract too, and you're like, what does that mean? They would love for him to translate, right? Like a right shot, big frame. I don't know that they've seen a ton from him where the, the the team is super impressed or he's high up the order. Again, it's not like the Red Wings are so full at defense like they are at forward, but it's it's a tougher nut to crack to make that blue line. So, I mean, seeing him game in and game out, and I think he still had, what, a handful of games in the ECHL as well last season with the Walleye, you would know... Yeah you would know better in terms of what he's working on in terms of fine tuning his game, but they want to see fewer deficiencies, I think, especially defensively. And if he's going to come in and be, you know, a guy who can provide offensively or at least be, you know, if not offensively, a steadying force, they want to see that translate at the AHL level. So for him to, to kind of stand out, I would think they would need him to stand out. And this is unfortunately the story for some prospects I think that you saw at preseason like you saw flashes from these guys where you're like yeah you know you see why they're higher up in the the prospect charter in the organization but then you talk to folks and and they'll say things like you know they're not ready they don't even look close to being ready and sometimes that's just the unfortunate reality I mean you guys cover the AHL and ECHL the unfortunate reality is the vast majority of these guys don't turn into NHLers right that's we always say on the show, like, pick your five favorite Red Wings prospects. Three of them probably aren't going to make it, or whatever the statistics are, right? Depending on where they are drafted. So, am I writing off Tommy still? No. Uh, I think he's got kind of similar to Soderblom. Uh, he's got a little bit of a queue in front of him of guys who are probably higher up the order. And at 20, was he? He was drafted 2019. Yeah, he was drafted 2019. So He'd be around 23 years old, 20, 22. Yeah. It's late. <laughs> yeah, it's late, right? Like, uh, are you going to see a massive change in him? I don't know. Defensemen, I will say, mature later in their career. So maybe he comes in and he gets sure. his cup of tea later on. But I'm not, uh, he's not, again, not at the top of people's list. Yeah, that's fair. He was, the, he was the second draft, right? Or second draft pick right after Cider in 2018. So he's he's had a weird he's had a weird path of being in Denver and then back and then back and forth. So it, it it's he, it's a strange it's a strange prospect. 
Yeah, picks. yeah, twenty nineteen because that was when they drafted. Yeah, fourth in that in the in round two. It went Pinto, Kaliev, Brink, Tommy Stone. I remember because I wanted all of Pinto, Kaliev, a Brink in that draft. Yeah, that's exactly how that went. <laughs> yeah, that's that's fair. The last guy I'll throw at you here, the big fella himself, Sebastian Cosa. We've talked about him a little bit throughout here, but what do you expect to see from him this year? And what do you want to see from him? Because he's made so many improvements from his year in the ECHL, his first year in the AHL. What do you want to see as his second year in the AHL? Well, I, I don't want to say this as if we didn't see this from him, especially as he warmed up and the season went on because, he, he, God, he was electric as he got rolling. But you want to see steadiness. You want to see him knowing where his net is. You want to see him you know, continuing to work on, on rebound control and positioning and uh, finding himself in fewer, you know, James Reimer, your swimming situations. And but he like you don't want to strip that away from him, right? He's an athletic goalie who has the size and the liber and the athleticism to kind of get out of position at times. But and that's fine. It's it's exhilarating to watch. But they want steadiness. Something we say on the show a lot is is goalies breaking into the league by and large suck. At the NHL level, it's hard to be. It's the hardest position to be good in at the NHL. You have to have patience with your goaltenders. You look at goalies who have excelled right off the bat in the NHL, and then they kind of tapered off for a little bit. Not really the best player to be talking about, but just because it's the example at the top of my mind, you look at Carter Hart's trajectory in the NHL when he was still in the NHL. It's hard to come in and be steady and be consistent. So with Kosa, there's no rush. They want him to learn that kind of refinement. They want to sand out the rough edges. When we talked to Kosa, I asked him, I was like, is my draft profile of you fair? Like, is this all the raw athleticism, all the talent in the world has the size needs to kind of sand down the rough edges, you know, be steadier net, have more consistency and, and just have quieter games. And he said, yeah, absolutely. So Coase is great. Cause I think he did a lot to that end last year under Koisinen's tutelage. And you want to see him do even more of that this year. If we're looking at Sebastian Coase saying, yeah, that's a veteran presence at age 21, 22 in the AHL. That'd be a phenomenal season for him. Yeah, I like that. I mean, Travis, you can add to as well. You've watched Costa longer than all of us here. You got to see him in that first year in the ECHL. And I know you've talked before, but just remind us what you've seen from the ECHL time to now with him. Um, yeah, so initially first game, like first few, like honestly, the first couple of months, it it was kind of like you'd see you see like the the flashes, right? Of Okay, this is why he was a very high draft pick. And then you'd see him also go through some growing pains. And you've seen that first year in Grand Rapids last year in the beginning of the year. And then it's like it just started to click. The game slowed down for him a little bit when he was with Toledo in the second half of the year. They went on a crazy run, and he was a part of a a playoff team that went deep in the playoffs. Um, last year, I mean – when I came up to Grand Rapids, I said to you guys, I was like, oh, my God, this is a completely different goaltender than day one Toledo last year. Like, it's just night and day different. And, and then seeing him at the red-white game, it's like he's made another, like, step. Like, it's just, like, keep continuously putting in the work. And it sounds like if you go back and watch his, like, waiting in the wings, uh, Watson talked about when he was with Toledo how he's just a constant worker. And – I, I really like to hear that. I think all Red Wings fans would love to hear that. So just continuously to take steps to get better in the long term. Yeah. Um, Nick, you wanted to add something about Marco Casper to this segment here real quick, or did you want to save that for the end? Uh, we can add it. So this question is for you, Ryan. So you mentioned Nate Danielson last year coming into – preseason and he did well and everybody was super excited about this guy just like Elmer did a couple of uh, the season prior came in played a few games and then this season we have Marco Casper coming in what do you think the difference is like Nate Davis had a whole season a whole another season a junior and then he's not knocking on the door like he was last year what do you think that difference is and where and like why did Marco now take that step up from like just Kind of the temperature out there in Wings Twitter sphere is kind of what I'm seeing. Well, I think it's important to note Marco Casper drafted 2022 and then played what was it? Rogla, 
like played two pro seasons. He played yep. in the SHL pro level as pro hockey against grown men. He was already playing for Rogla, like had had played there uh, in those in that system, and then played in Grand Rapids. I think it's just more pro time. I think it's having more time to mature. Marco Casper came in and had a tough preseason with the Red Wings last year. Like it was not good. And I think that was surprising for me because he was kind of touted as a very NHL ready prospect. His game would translate to to being up to speed sooner in terms of what he was good at. And I think he had a tough Red Wings preseason last year. And I think he had a tough start to the year in the AHL. But much like Sebastian Cosa, he had that grind. He worked on the season as he went on. And he did that against grown men in one of the best leagues in the world in the AHL. And I think that makes all the difference in the world when you're talking about rookies and prospects making the team. Something people lose sight of is not every prospect coming into the league is Connor Bedard, you know, Austin Matthews going back in the day. I can't believe it was said back in the day. But uh, Ovechkin and Crosby, for example, 100 points right off the bat. Like, it's just not, those are exceptions. And and because we talk about them so much, people kind of conflate that with, oh, that's the rookie experience. It's not. Casper and the Danielson, like, that's how it goes often, even for talented rookies. So all that to say, these development years are crucial. And I think Marco Casper's tough lessons that he learned last year and pro seasons that he has over Nate Danielson are the difference. And, And you'll see that because I don't think... I think Casper is underrated in terms of what his ceiling is, but I, I don't think it's disagreeable to say da- Nate Danielson has a higher overall ceiling. Just guesswork. That's all prospect is. But Marco Casper is a better player right now. Just how it is because of, of that development. Yeah, I agree with that. Moving on from that segment there. Thank you for that. I know that was difficult. Not obviously watching every Griffins game like we have for the last couple of years here, but this question might also still be a little tough. And what do you want to see is most improved for the Grand Rapids Griffins this year? Like, what do you want to see them improve on most? They came in last season, brought playoff hockey back to Grand Rapids. Dan Watson and the coaching staff did a fantastic job. We saw tons of development with players. But what are you hoping to see improve the most this year? Uh, Brandon, this isn't hard for me. This is all chat GPT feeding me the script. I'm not thinking anything right now. Perfect. Uh, yeah. For me, it's you want to continue the ball rolling from last season. And that means not having a slow start and having yourself to having to go on this like prolific winning streak and you know dominating at home or whatever it is like you want to have a more consistent season don't have it to break into the playoffs in the latter third or or move up the order steady yourself because it that 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 allows you to do things on two fronts one you're you're able to do your as sean said primary task of develop players for the nhl club without worrying so much about having to to ice rosters that will go out and maybe have fewer guys who will uh, you know have a chance of making the show but are more likely to win and two that kind of steadiness does lend to better prospect growth and it's just like it's this upward supporting cycle of you make guys more comfortable in the system and then they're going to be more comfortable playing and they're going to be able to develop better so my my big brain answer here is play good hockey much earlier but i i think it's just really get the ball rolling on the things that worked out well and part of it too is dan watson was completely new to the organization like for that staff to kind of get their feet under them and get a feel for for the season and lots of change in the organization as well as the red wings turned things over uh, the griffins were kind of this last vestige of uh, a lot of the things of the holland era so i think it's pretty understandable why they had a slower start but yeah just you know you're one of the top teams believe in that and, and keep going with it so and then if you want to look at position wise, Coase is there, yes, but the the goalie situation, I think you want to make, find a solution fast because you guys will know, especially in the lower leagues, a bad goalie situation will pull the floor right out from beneath you. Yeah, we, we, we've we joked about seeing a season where Sebastian Coase plays 50 games. I don't want to see that, but we got to do what we got to do. But we, we don't want to see an Alex Lyon situation. We don't want a Billy Huso situation where we just use him and use him and use him. And then all of a sudden he falls off. We want it to be consistent and good. And especially with the minors, you're playing back to backs constantly. It does have yeah. to be solved pretty quick. Um, I know if I ask Nick this question, most improved this year, he's going to say the power play. So we'll skip and save everybody time there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, Nick, do you think it'll be better this year? I think that it, I, it's weird. Like you're sharing the note with me that I literally had power play on there. And uh, yeah, it, it that's my biggest uh, hope for improvement is there. Uh, I think it will be better. We have a lot more talented guys. And as you saw, like through preseason two, and even what I saw in training camp is, 
you know, putting Marco, putting Nate, putting Ammo all together on the power play or them rotating in and out. So I think we just have more skilled players to be able to put the puck in the net. And Ammo's more aggressive this year, too, of shooting that puck towards the net. So, I mean, you got to shoot to be able to get the goal, right? So more shots on that equals more goals at some point. Yeah. I want to get everyone's opinion of who they think is going to be the MVP for the Griffins this year. I, I, we could argue it was Jonathan Berggren last year and because it was. But, Ryan, I'm going to go to you first. Who do you think is going to stand out as the MVP on this team this year? Way too early prediction to make. Yeah, I don't know. I kind of want to give you a sexy answer here. Like, I want to say Ammo. I want to say Lombardi comes in and is just, like, thrilling top to bottom. But, you know, logic dictates that maybe it's uh, Mazer if he stays all year. If if and we have different problems if Casper's down here all year, like tune into the Wind Wheel Pod to hear Brad have an aneurysm in real time. But if Marco Casper <laughs> stays down, he's likely to do it. Um, Cosa, but I'll I'll go Lombardi. I'll I'll say he takes a big step and just shines, which like is not answer. a pun about shine, but you know, I'll take that one too. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, what do you got? Right, are you in our note too? Because uh, I. <laughs> I have a static Twitter note, brother. This is all <laughs> this is all off the cuff. <laughs> uh, I literally have Amadeus Lombardi as the MVP. I just think it's going to be a breakout year. Uh, my next one was Casper, but I just assumed with Casper probably being called up uh, to the Red Wings that Ammo is going to have that spot to be able to up for grabs for him to take. And I think the progression that he had from last year to this year Nate's still going to play a little bit of catch up, just try to get into the organization and the systems and everything uh, and getting his feet going. I think that's where it's going to be Amadeus is, uh, for MVP. All right, Travis. Elmer. Ooh, that's an I've, answer. I've said all I've said pretty much all summer that I think this is going to be like his big year. Um, I, I just think he's poised to have a good year. I like that. I'm going to go with, if we have them all season, it's Carter Mazer. I think what we saw in the playoffs last year where he really just locked in and did some amazing things, if he can stay healthy and stay in the lineup all year, I, he's going to have an incredible year. But also, if he spends some time in Detroit, too, I won't be mad about that. So I'm, I'm going to take the probably safe answer and just say Mazer. But who knows? This team is stacked. It's going to be a fun one to watch this year up and down the lineup. So. I think the last question I'll ask for you, Ryan, here before we let you free for the night is just what theme night are you most excited about this year? Because I know you guys like the theme nights and the Grand Rapids Griffins do them extremely well. Which one do you like the most on their calendar? Oh, man. I, I, there's, I, there are very few NHL teams I could think of who do theme nights as well as the Griffins do. They're just an incredible crew over there. I have my toasters jersey next to me, so it's really hard to top a flying toaster jersey, which, like, I love a baby blue jersey. I think that's just so sick. Um, so that's gonna be a hard one. I will say back in the day when they did the original Jurassic Park jerseys, like was so upset that I didn't have the money to buy one of those now. The difference is now I still don't have the money, uh, but I just know it's an irresponsible purchase. But uh, the fact that they're doing the Griffins uh, Jurassic Park jersey style giveaway tonight is like, that's a lot of fun. We've been waiting for that one. So yeah, that's definitely gonna be the one we're looking forward to the most. Yeah, I think that's mine too as well. I'm excited to see those gridiron jerseys on on the ice with all the hype and the lions right now. Those will be fun too. But yeah, the Jurassic Park ones, that's going to be one that someone's going to have to take my wallet from me at the game, I think, because that is an irresponsible purchase, 100%. <laughs> Can I throw one in from Toledo for Ryan? Oh, yeah, what you got? They're doing a Red Wings mashup down here. Oh, year. I think, I, I don't know if I saw a concept or the, what the actual jersey is going to look like, but I'm excited for that one. Yeah, I was, I was, I seen Red Wings mashup, and I was like, okay, are they gonna do a Storm jersey, or are they gonna make a Red Wings jersey? <laughs> it's gonna be interesting. I'm excited to see what that actually does look like out there, and maybe that's another night we get down to Toledo. I hope we got to get the Wing Wheel Boys down to Toledo at some point. I know the fans are here for it and they want it. We got to make it happen, Ryan. Yeah, we're we're overdue. You know, we're still we we're too far removed from the COVID excuse to say, you know, oh, COVID made it hard to. To do all this, we do have to 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 get out there. Been chatting for for some time with some folks from the walleye. So yeah, definitely overdue to to make it out to a walleye game. I heard it's just such a blast. It's an environment like no other. It's insane. I yeah. never expected it my first time walking in there, and now I'm addicted to it. So 
It's crazy. But that's all we have for questions for you, Ryan. We appreciate you so much coming on the show. Again, I know it's super late at night, but we appreciate you taking the time to do this. A little bit of season preview with us. And uh, we always do this for every guest, even though I assume everybody that listens to this show knows where to find you guys. But we give you the floor to say whatever you'd like and tell the folks where to find you and what you guys are working on. I got to tell you, I've been podcasting for almost 10 years. I'm still bad at this part. Uh, part of the uh, Winged Wheel podcast. So uh, all things Detroit Red Wings hockey, NHL, World of Hockey, uh, wherever you get your podcast. If you want to look at our ugly mugs on YouTube, we're on YouTube, but you know, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, etc. If you go to wingedwheelpodcast.com, we're there. Uh, our season preview is coming out Wednesday, October 9th for the Detroit Red Wings. We record and post twice a week. Bonus episodes, all that. So uh, yeah, and I, I really appreciate you guys having me on again for the the time delay. But I uh, just want to acknowledge you guys are, are have been supportive of the podcast for a long time, and it's very cool to watch you do your thing with this. So that was a no brainer for me to to take the time. Um, I was very happy to do it. So I uh, really really appreciate all your support, and you guys do a fantastic job over here. Thank you. We appreciate that a lot. Yeah, we always say it. Your guys' show is one of the reasons we started doing this. So. It's crazy how that works and it's been a pleasure meeting you guys and chatting with you guys and just continue to do what you guys do. We appreciate it. So thank you, man. Enjoy the season. And I'm sure this won't be the last time we talk to you this season. Definitely. Take care, boys. Hockey is in the air and the throw of the game is bringing Griffith fans from all over the state to the Van Andel Arena. So when you're looking to get tickets, your number one choice should be Game Time. Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets to see your favorite teams play live even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals a great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. You can see players like Marco Casper and Sebastian Cosa before they make their way to the wings and you get the seat views before you buy. So you can see what it looks like from where you'll be sitting, which is one of my favorite things about game time. Curated deals make it easier to find the best price on great seats and with the lowest price guarantee, event cancellation protection, job loss protection, and more. Game time should be your number one destination for your tickets. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time pick. Download the game time app, create an account, and you Use code THPN for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code THPN for $20 off. Download game time today. What time is it? Game time. And welcome back to just the three of us. Thank you again to Ryan for hopping on the show. I know that's something we've kind of wanted to do for a while, but we really didn't have the time or schedule to really make it happen. But we wanted to make sure it happened before the season started and couldn't really think of a better episode to do it with than the season preview for the Griffins. So thank you again to him and make sure everyone go check out the Wing Wheel podcast if you haven't yet. I don't know how you haven't yet if you haven't, but make sure you follow the boys. They do incredible work. And I know their Red Wing season preview drops either today or the day after this episode, something like that. Ryan mentioned it in the recording. Make sure you check that out. And of course, follow along with them all season. But before we end the episode, we didn't want to put Ryan through the next segment of this episode because we would have kept him up till midnight. Um, we're going to try to predict the Griffins lineup for opening night. We did an episode back a few weeks ago with the Hockey Town Rundown show, and we did a way too early to predict Griffins roster prediction episode, and it was kind of crazy. Now we know who's where, what players are actually going to be in Grand Rapids, at least on opening night. So it's time for us to put our thinking caps on here and actually see if we can get anywhere close to what Dan Watson's going to field on the ice, even though we know he's going to go 11 and 7 just to prove us wrong. But we'll start with this here. As you're watching on YouTube, you can actually see what we're doing. We'll do our best to describe it so that people not on YouTube to be able to understand what we're doing here and hopefully. Uh, we can get through this relatively quick. I think it'll be quicker than what we uh, what we think. But for comparison before, for the folks watching on YouTube, this was the one that we did with the Rundown Boys. This was our too early to predict roster. And I'll run through it real fast. Snively, Casper, and Mazer on the first line. Rakowski, Dries, Elmer on the second line. Gettinger, Nate, and Shiner on the third line. Hunter, Ammo, and Seeger on the fourth line. On the defensive side, you had Wallander and Tuo as your top pairing. William Didier is the second pairing. Vero Rafferty is the third pairing. And your goalies were Sebastian Cosa and Jack Campbell. Now, we obviously know things have changed a little bit in the structure of the team since then. Jack's in the players' assistance program, and we, we know that changed everything. Subban was added. So we know that's going to be the goalie tandem, right? We'll start there. We'll make this the easiest possible way to start this ep- this part of the episode off. The goalies. It's a lock. We know Kosa's the starter. Subban's the backup. We in agreement there, boys? Yep. Yeah, that's easy. Should we do defense too first? Because we know that's going to be probably pretty easy. Yes. 
Yes. Okay. So first pairing defense, Nick, what do you got? Oh, what do I have? Uh, we started with Volinder and Tuo because that's who we had with the rundown boys. And we are kind of going off of that based off of Dan Watson, just really giving those two guys a push based off of the where they are in the organization. Like those are the two next guys to make a jump. Uh, we have to change. I feel like we have to change it now. <laughs> And the reason is, is because we just landed a huge NHL defenseman and he goes by the name Justin Hole. So yeah. I'm going to have to put him in there as the right D. I think he's going to surprise some Griffins guys, you know, uh, <laughs> some of uh, Griffins fans. But I think that's where he, he's going to go in as our number one defenseman. Yeah, I would agree. I think he obviously is going to fit that role. Well, we've said it before. Travis has mentioned it multiple times. If he's making less money, he's still in the NHL. So, and he's going to be a good fit here. He's a good six, seven D man. Like he's going to be a top D man on this team. And it's going to be really good for one of these younger guys to learn from him. And Travis, who do you think that younger guy on the other side of him is going to be? Wally. Yeah, it's got to be Wally, right? Only makes sense. Now, the second pairing, I think this one we have more clarity on as well compared to the past where we said Booyam and Didier. Shy is still on IR, so we can't put him in the lineup. I do have him and Gettinger listed on screen here, both on injured reserve. But who is going to be on the second pairing? Travis, who do you got on the left side? Uh, Lagason. Lagason. Why are you going to go Lagason? Pretty much just because um, you know he's signed to... Uh, a Red Wings contract initially coming down. Uh, he can provide that steady um, play on the left side uh, for the partner that I think be on his right side, um, which I can either say that or I can let Nick fill that in. Um, if you want me to say it, I'll say it. It's 2-0. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just think I just think that pairing would work well together. Uh, Legacy's played NHL games. Also played American League games, 2-0, trying to make that next step in his development to work his way to possibly push him for a spot in the NHL in the future. Um, just really think that that would be a good pairing, and you keep the left-right together. Yeah, I do like that. It is nice having a solid top four there that is balanced with left and right shot, D-man. Now, the third pairing is where I think it gets interesting on this team. What do you guys think is going to go down here? Because there's there's quite a few options you, know, you got Brogan Rafferty, Emil Vero, Josiah Didier, and Troy Dello still sitting there as available guys. So, Nick, who do you think is going to take that left D spot on the team on the third pairing? I think you put Vero. Um, yeah, why is that? I think this – the kid showed well. The kid has showed well when he's been healthy. I'm really hoping that he has a good season this year. He stays healthy. Uh, he's already left D. And the reason I'm putting him there is because I think the right defensive partner is going to be Josiah Didier. Like, you can't sit the captain for opening night, right? Like, that's, come on. You got to, I mean, last year they didn't start a captain. So you can give him a break there. But I think you go with Josiah Didier. And he was paired up with Vero during practice and training camp um, a lot. So there was a couple different, a couple different times that they were paired up together. So that's why I'm thinking Dids and Vero. I'm really hoping, like I really, I'm rooting for Vero. I, I hope he does have a big year and he he turns it around. That turns it around, but he just he just stays healthy. I think that's the biggest thing that he needs. And that third spot is a good spot for him to kind of like get his get his legs back under him and prove you know he can move up or he can move down. But I'm hoping he stays here and he moves up. So what convinces you to put Vero there over a guy like Brogan Rafferty? Uh, I mean, you want to have balance, right? Of like, we always say it balance, but having the prospect in, having a veteran, Raf could sit for the game. Not a, like, I don't want to say it's not a big deal, but I th he he's a veteran. He can... How many veterans do we have at that point? So we still actually are one short. Uh, I think Austin really? Watson puts us at the seven limit, actually. Okay. I remember checking it the other day that Griffin's website wasn't fully updated, 
But last I checked, and while we're going throughout this, I will try to make sure I double check myself there and correct myself if I'm wrong. But I believe we are at a flat seven, which is a really nice change of pace from years prior. Yeah, was, where somebody had to rotate out. But yeah. the um, because who I had for veterans was it's the hole throws me off, Legacy throws me off, and so our veterans right now are, are Dominic Shine. Genger, Dries, Lagasin, and Didier. And the limit is six. And we're at five. But that was before Justin Hole being added. Does, he count, step. Does he count being on an NHL contract? Yeah, he would still count being on okay. that NHL deal. Sometimes there's loopholes. Because he's not That's an emergency. The only ones they wouldn't count is going to be like the emergency uh, conditioning stint or anything like that. Okay. Those Those wouldn't count towards that rule. So we this do have to take learning. that. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Well, we got you taught us that the wall, I can only feel four. So we didn't know that until we met you. So, yeah, this we do have to take that into consideration, definitely, um, when it comes to this. I'm, that, so, that, that's probably the good argument there where it comes to Vero over uh, Rafferty. And Rafferty is not a veteran, but I just, I just, he's, he's a senior guy. I think they just kind of try to let the kids go out and play and, um, yeah, just kind of prove themselves. Yeah. Cause Rafferty doesn't fall under that. And just double checking myself here too. Austin Watson did get added as a veteran, obviously too. So yeah, okay. I mean, we're at what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exactly. Yeah. The limit six. Limit is six, so we do have to sit one. I, th I think it's a make or break year for Vero. It is. It is a hundred percent a make or break year for Vero. I think you know we've heard rumblings from different channels that that's gonna it's it's the year for him to show what he's got. So I don't think we'll see him back down in Toledo at any point in time. I don't think that's gonna happen. I think this is his year to prove it in Grand Rapids or ride the press box. So it's it's gonna be interesting. Um. And it's so not his fault, I think, either. Like his his play has been good. It's just he just hasn't been healthy. That, that, I think that's been the biggest knock on him, to be honest. Yeah, that does not help things at all. Um, like, like his first game back last season from injury, he ended up getting like a goal and two assists. Was like the third star, but he ended up getting hurt, and they he was out for the rest of the season. Like kind of like rehabbing. So we do like the grit that he brings to the table, especially opening nights versus Milwaukee, and you want some grit. <laughs> Yeah. So that does help to have, and so does it with uh, Didier, which I guess I got to put him on the lineup here as well. If we're going Dids on the right side, and Rafferty, the odd man out that night, it's just, it feels weird to yeah say that that's what's going to happen with it there though. Man, I don't know because he was he was the second he had the second highest amount of points for defensemen in Grand Rapids last year, sixty two games, twenty nine points, right behind Simon Edmondson's thirty points in fifty four games. He actually had eight more points than Albert Johansson, so. It I mean, does feel wrong to kind of hold him out of the lineup. You could put him I'm with Lagus instead of Lagus, and you could put him there. I don't think you hold Lagus out of the lineup. I don't. Yeah, that's. It's a it's weird. Just, it's like a top-heavy team now. <laughs> like with these guys, <laughs> some of his defensemen. Yeah, I mean, if we're going based off, I mean, obviously we saw all these guys a little bit in you know preseason and training camp action, but you're talking about putting. Josiah Didier in, yes, he's the captain. Eight points last season. Emil Vero, six points last season over a 29-point Rogan Rafferty. I, I, I don't think that's the right choice. I don't know. Travis, what do you think, based on just kind of throwing those stats out there? Well, I think you're going to see Tuo and Wally take steps on the point side of it, which will kind of offset for Rafferty kind of coming in and out, probably for Vero. I could see. Or even Legison. But I mean maybe I'm talking crazy. This is my first year with the Griffins, so we're all talking crazy though. So it works. Um unless they go eleven and seven, which wouldn't be a shocker. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Which so I think Rafferty is, there. is really realistically what'll probably happen. Like I said, Dan's gonna do it just to make us eat our words here and not make you know this roster anywhere close to accurate. But We'll leave it as it is right now. The nice thing is we don't have, as we build this right now, we don't have to worry about the veteran rule because Gettinger is one of those veterans and he's out. So, so we are right at the six with the full roster that we have. So let's start building up the forward side of things. I think we should do this by position. So do the centers, wingers, 
left wing. And I think that makes sense. It's like, we may have done this before and it went all over the place. Are you guys in favor of doing it that direction? The way we did it with run down or the way we did it last night? <laughs> no, saying we're going to do all the centers first and then <laughs> left wings with the depends on who we <laughs> consider a center. <laughs> oh, this is going to get interesting. All right. So first line center for this team, who is it going to be? Nick. Nick. Oh, I'm not playing center. I'll tell you that right now. I can barely <laughs> skate. So the first person we're going to put there is Sheldon Dries. Come on down. Any reason behind that or just, just throwing it in there? Alphabetical. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, he, I mean, he played center. He's a veteran. He's bringing in. I think uh, we saw this during training camp in preseason as he, center in that top the kind of that top line uh with the two right and left wingers that we'll get to here in a minute okay who's going to be our second line center let's go to travis marco polo <laughs> i knew that was going to happen marco casper yeah for sure second line center opening night 100 no doubt in my mind third line center and Ace lombardi travis Nate. I have to beat the tiebreaker here. <laughs> it's I got a lot of hate for it the first time we did it. So yep. let's do it again. <laughs> Nate Danielson. Wasn't enough. <laughs> I actually welcome it. Bring it on. I no, don't. I actually I don't. My mental health's important. <laughs> yeah. Well, you'll be out of the you'll be out of the state. You can handle it. That's 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 fair. Uh fourth, fourth line center. Amadeus Lombardi. Travis. Dominic Shine. Woo this is where it gets fun. Uh, okay, so here's the thing. I agree with Travis, and this is the reason why. And I know we've talked about this extensively on the show. But Ryan Hanna even agreed with us tonight that Amadeus Lombardi's path to the NHL is probably not at center. It's going to be at the wing position. We saw him play wing in the red and white game. We saw him do it in training camp. We saw it during preseason. He looked really good. He was tossed all over the place, but he did really well on the wing. And the wing allows him to kind of be more free, especially if he's paired up with guys that are going to be fast like him. Depending on who ends up on this fourth line with him, if that's what you're going to try to put him fourth line center, I don't think that's just a good fit. He's going to outskate everybody around him. What's wrong with that? It's going to be offside central when they try to enter the zone setting up plays. No, no, no. I mean, like, if you put him there, like, hypothetically. No, he's going to outskate his teammates, is what I'm no, saying. No, no, no. Oh, 100%. Well, no. Okay, I got a theory on this. I'm going to say something negative, but I'm going to hold back. I If you put Deuce there on the left wing and you put Elmer as the right, he'll be fine. I think Elmer is beyond a fourth line player on this team after last season. But Travis, what do you have to add to that real quick before we skip over your thought? So this is a very like blown out of proportions take, but I like what it. Was the, what was the biggest problem with Connor McDavid for many years? He played uh, for Edmonton. No, they couldn't find guys <laughs> to keep up with his pace. Yeah, and I that's where I think Marco on the wing. You mean ammo just, on the wing? Or yeah, ammo on the wing. I'm sorry. I, I like that idea too. Well, when he probably breaks into the NHL, they'll probably both start on the wing. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't um, want to jump too far ahead, too, but it makes sense, right? Like, we're going to talk about wingers here in a minute, but having top lines with guys that can rotate in and play center when one guy gets kicked out of the faceoff circle, it's it's worth it. It's very much worth it. And why not get him used to a position that's going to set him up for success down the road? I just think it it really doesn't make sense to not put him center because we're going 11 and 7 anyways. So just put him center because he's going to be able to take the face-offs because he is stronger this year. And we're just going to rotate a right winger in there anyways, or a left winger. So his face-off percentages in the preseason were not good. They right. He's not he good at NHL all. talent, not AHL talent. No. No. <laughs> it's, I Do think it's really time want... to graduate him to the wing. Do, do you to the want... wings? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me ask you this, Nick. Like, do you want a 
fourth liner to be a playmaker. Yeah, why not? You have Joe. You had Joe Valeno fourth line in the wings. Who's? It's not a playmaker. Yeah, I well, wouldn't say that's a playmaker. Whoa, whoa, He's but two two way that, player. That's what he was drafted for. Thirtieth overall. First round, first round pick. Okay, look at the look at the statistics from top ten to thirty, and how many guys make it. <laughs> He's on the bubble, so <laughs> with a one year prove it contract. Two years. Get me started. Don't get me started with Joe <laughs> I know what you're trying to do. Don't Joey get me started. Yeah. Uh, I you think get... just for this organization and this year, you're going to see Amo play more center than you're going to see him play wing. I That's hot just, take. I would be willing to put money on it. Oh? I think he's going to play more wing than center. We're going to keep track He's of shown that he can play the wing very well. And like we like. Travis said, you know, putting him with guys that are the same speed as him or that can keep up. Can you imagine a flying Marco Casper and Amadeus Lombardi trying to enter the zone together there? Like, I'm hinting, obviously, that I'm going to try to put ammo at mm-hmm. left wing on the second line. It, it's, I don't know, I think he's earned that spot. Or, or he's third line winger with Nate Danielson. I'll give you that. Either way. Okay, then he's playing on the wing then. You just said you gave it. There you go. I think it's the move, man. But what do you think? Trying to get inside the head of Dan Watson here, which is pretty. I don't think he wants to just play. I think he wants to play. We've talked to him before when he's not playing. Yeah, that was not fun. I mean, it was fun to talk with him. (laughs) He was not in a good mood. He was bummed. Yeah, he wants to play. He's going to play wherever he's told to play. I think this preseason and training camp kind of unlocked a new opportunity for him. I agree. That's his path. So, so we're gonna go centers, Dries, Casper, Nate, and John. You know, if I was smarter than what I am now, I would have messaged Dog yesterday and asked him for the lineup. <laughs> he wouldn't have given it to you. Dang it! There's no way he would. Have, he would have given you some off the wall craziness yeah. to make you sound insane on here, and I would have been dying laughing. I'd be like, I have some right. inside source. Yeah. Uh huh. So let's jump through the wingers here. I'd say we start on the left wing because I think this one will, will go pretty quick. Uh, first line left wing, Travis. Who is it going to be? Snively. Yeah, I would agree with that. Nick, are you in agreement there? Yeah. Did you put them in order how you wanted them, or did you just put them no. as a random? No, I just pulled them off and put them in a random spot there. Yeah. Sus. Yeah. All right. Well. Yeah, because the next one on the right side it pretty much makes sense. But anyways, <laughs> second line, left wing. Nick, I know you know what Travis and I might say, but what are you going to say? Um, oh, This one's a tough one. I, you know, I'm kind of torn because I, I like Hunter Johannes' offensive upside there. So I'm kind of stuck between him going second or ammo there between the second and third line. Since that's the that's where I'm being pigeonholed into of making these You're choices. Welcome. So uh hopefully the people in the comments will back me here <laughs> and tell me that I'm right and that you guys are wrong. But we'll go I, I mean I I like ammo being on this probably more than that third with Nate. To be honest, I think you could see a lot more goals that route. I, I don't think Casper, I don't know. I do want to remind you both, too, that during training camp, we saw a lot of Marco Casper and Nate Danielson together. Yeah, that's why so maybe that, that does make things interesting, too, where you could think about a second line of a Nate and Casper and, and ammo? a third line with ammo at the center. No, if you want to put ammo back at center, I would be willing to accept bumping Nate or bumping Marco to a wing position. That'd be that'd be kind of fun. Let's do that. Let's just put Nate, Marco, and Ammo all on a line together. I didn't say Ammo was included in that. Why? I'm just. I'm giving. That. I'm. I'm still allowing you to put him on the wing. We're putting Nate on the wing. Casper in the center. That's the best. Well, then then we really run out of center there. capable players. So. No, 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 we've got enough because you can put Snively in the wing or in the center. He's left wing, top line. <laughs> 
Oh, but he's listed as a center. I won't let you guys forget. You guys told me that for three weeks. He was listed as a center. So but anyways, play center. Nick is starting all the fights tonight. <laughs> he's going to get five in the box for fighting. He told me to bring it tonight, and I'm bringing it. He's he's bringing it. <laughs> um, I don't know. Travis, what do you think about that? On the left side, second line. Well, yeah, seeing like, so we saw Nate taking face-offs in the red and white game with Casper at his, uh, I believe it was left wing. And then we saw it once early in the preseason. I don't know if it was the game you were at or not. I think they put Casper on the wing there just because if he was going to make the wings, that's where he was going to be. Which is still a potential thing as well. Hmm. I, I, I think that's why Casper was playing the wing. So do you think that they would do something like that? Put Casper on the wing, put Nate at center, and then put Ammo as the third line center? I don't think so. I think they still want I think they still see them both as centers in the NHL long term. So I, I okay, so a transition from center to wing is a lot easier than a winger to a center. Unbelievably easier. Like I think the only guy that's ever done it and done it very well is Mark Messier. Like right. like not a big really, deal, you know. Just there's really only guy. like one guy that's done it. So yeah. like it just makes more sense that they would keep them both at center because then you're still getting draws, and the more draws that you can get, the better. So I, I really think that you would it makes more sense to just kind of leave the centers where they're at now and then you move ammo to the wing on his strong side. When you watch the the game that Caster kind of like broke through the door, Trav, where he scored the two goals. Yeah. Where where was he playing at that on that game? I believe he was a center that game. He was so center that game. Let's keep him there. Okay. So are, are we going ammo suddenly a second line center or are we putting or sorry, second line left wing or somebody else there? I would put ammo on the second line with Marco. But yeah. there, but there could be an argument for Nate too, because didn't ammo play a lot of fourth line minutes last year? He did. Ammo played a lot of fourth line minutes last year, usually with rotating teammates. So the argument could be made he could play third line center or third line left wing. I'm sorry. I just think him and Nate's game are more similar than his and Casper's. And that's kind of where I was like, I think he's more on that third line with Nate. This would be a lot easier if Gettinger was healthy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. So much easier. Marco. Or Gettinger. Correct. Yeah. Sorry. Yep. You had that right. Gettinger would play with Marco. Um, I say due to injury currently, the uh, ammo game one, if this is the opening night roster, game one, you, you throw them at second line left wing. Because at that point, if you don't do that, then you're either throwing Hunter up there, which I'm not opposed to, but I don't just I don't see that happening. Um, or you're throwing Cross up there or Deuce. I say you go ammo. Hunter Cross. Ammo Hunter. Are we and cross? You think it cross there? Yeah. Leaving Deuce out of the that, that side. Yeah. And this one I'm going at you're gonna <laughs> this one my logic is more experienced than one with the defense where I went with less experience. <laughs> Okay, that's fair. I, I will I'll <laughs> accept the confusing logic, and the listeners can uh, unpack that on their own. I don't want to do it yeah. for them. Um, all right, let's nail, down the, a week. <laughs> let's nail down the right side here. Uh, we obviously know who the first right winger is. It's going to be Carter Mazer. That's that's a no-brainer, right? Are we, are um, we sure Rafferty can't play the right wing? I don't know. Rafferty might be able to do it all. He's an expert driver. We know that. Yeah, let's let's keep uh, Mays there because that's that was the lineup during practice preseason. Yeah, and we loved this lineup. Like the this line together was great. The chemistry was amazing. The red and white game they looked unstoppable. So love that. Now, who plays the right side with Ammo and Casper? Elmer, Travis. Yeah. Oh, it's I Elmer. thought you were going to tell me Rikloski. I thought you were going to challenge that, Trav. No, I got I, my challenge is my challenge is on the left wing. But we'll wait for that. <laughs> wait for it. You're out of challenges. Oh, we'll I'm... just put Rikloski at the uh, third line right wing. That yep. third line is sneaky good. 
the way we just put it on paper. Hunter Johannes, Nate Danielson, and Jacob Rakowski. That's I like it. It could be a lot of fun. And, and Nate and Rakowski practiced together too during preseason and camp. So that chemistry is already starting to build there. Yeah, it's good. And what I like about the second line is that chemistry is just there across the board. We know Ammo and Elmer had unstoppable chemistry last year. Casper can fit in with pretty much anybody on this team with how much 11 and 7 we played. He played a lot with Elmer on the wing. He played a ton with him last year. So I'm pretty confident there. The first line is going to take some getting used to each other, but it looks like they're already pretty comfortable. So fourth line right wing. Your options left are Austin Watson and Alexander Doucette. For game one versus Milwaukee, who do you put at right wing, Travis? Austin Watson. Nick? Austin. Well, yeah, we'll go with Watson. But I thought we were going 11 and 7. So I didn't even want to, we didn't need to. Oh, we're building, so we're building the roster without 11 and 7, knowing that Dan will probably screw us and do that. But that's fine. <laughs> we're just going to build a normal opening night roster. Just like how the Red Wings have with no extra. We're going to do our thing here, you know. We still love um, you, Dan. <laughs> we do. We just know you're going to go 11 and 7 just to make us look like fools. And we accept that. Except that a long time ago. We are fools. So that, as it sits right now, we'll let the objections come in here in a second, is the opening night roster as we've agreed so far. With Snively, Dries, and Baser on the first line. With Wallander and Hull on defense in the first pairing there. Second line forwards, Ammo, Casper, Elmer. Second pairing defense, Lagason and 2-0. Third pairing offense, Hunter, Nate, and Raklovsky. Third pairing defense, Biro, Didier. And then your fourth line forwards, it's going to be Cross, Shine, and Watson, which honestly is a pretty gritty darn line. So it's interesting. Travis, I know there's an objection on the left side for you. What is it? Flip. Okay, so before I say flip, you're going to have, Again, now again, I'm fairly new to the Griffins. So when Cross was drafted, if I'm not mistaken, he was a fairly decent point producer in junior. He was. He was. Oh, let's see, because he played for Portland, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, his last season in Portland, he's 63 games. He had 86 points. Right. He's produced 17 and 30 games in his first season as a Griffin with an injury that year, and then 16 and 58 games last year. I just think the offensive upside would be better with Nate and Rykowski. And then you have a true identity line with Hunter shine and Watson. Oh, so you're saying put cross with Nate and Rykowski. Yeah. And Hunter shine and Watson. Nick, I'll hear your argument. So the one thing I want to say about this lineup this year with the Griffins is it's going to be very fluid. You know, people right. are going to move up. People are going to move down. Uh, people are going to be in. Some people are going to be out. It's going to be very fluid with players moving all over. So especially with Detroit call-ups and injuries, it's it's going to be fluid. Uh, more fluid with the way to Detroit to Grand Rapids than is fluid for Grand Rapids to Toledo. Did I say fluid enough to beat Derek Lalone's press conference of using the word fluid? Uh, I, I think... don't know. You might have caught up. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I like that idea there, Travis. Uh, moving Cross up, and then you've got kind of a score third line because Nate between Nate Cross and Rikowski, like they're more on the offensive side. I like like Hunter will surprise you. Like he had a good offensive upside as well. Not only like beating the crap out of people or being physical. He also has that offensive upside that he just, you haven't seen, but I saw it during practice. Like I saw it while I was up in Traverse city and he had this shot that just went upper, upper 90 in the goal. It, it was, it was crazy on Alex Lyon. And I was just like, Holy crap. He was the only guy to score in that practice. So I like that idea, but I also want the idea of Hunter being able to protect Nate or Rikowski if things go sideways. So you still have a line out there that's able to, you still have a player out there that can still be supportive and aggressive and protect, but also get that sneaky goal. On top of that, you've got him, because the third line D will match up with the third line forwards, right? Yeah, it depends on the night. Sometimes they swap. I'm like, you've got Hunter and Nate protecting Bureau on the left side, which yeah, will help. Protection. 
I mean, well, not no, no, protection, but to, for help for uh, on the offensive side of those two guys are re- defensively responsible. They'll be able to come back and help support Miro and give him good outlet uh, outlets out like options out. But Travis, your reply to the rebuttal. I mean, like you said, it's going to be fluid and it, it could change in game. I think either <laughs> will either will work. I just, I, I'm kind of in the mindset. I always love a shutdown line or just a line. That's a total pain to play against. Um, not again, not to say cross can't do it. This is my first go around with the Griffins. So I'm kind of learning along and kind of basing my opinions off of what you guys saw last year. Um, and we haven't seen a full season of Hunter at the pro level yet. So again, yeah. like, like you don't, really know what you get with cross you kind of know what you have you at least have an established ahl player that's played ahl games you know i get that hunter played what six games last year i believe it was nate the playoffs. Uh, yeah. nate didn't play but one Until game the playoffs he played one yeah. game and reiklovsky hasn't played north american pro hockey so I don't know. I'm just kind of looking for some like balance, as we like to say. <laughs> I do love so, balance. I, that's why I kind of went with Cross up there on the third line, just because he's at least played American League games, and he's shown in the past he can produce at a, over a point per game pace. I just I don't I don't know. Like, but this is where my opinion might be stupid because I no. haven't watched the Griffins enough, so it's just my opinion. So off the record, you just have not seen Cross Hannes. Like, hold on, hold on. Hold I said off the record. Off the record, <laughs> he hits a no. lot of crossbars. Like the sure. kid was famous last year for hitting crossbars. Like he just defensively, he's not sound either. Like that's that's why Nate will bail him out. <clears throat> Your wingers are less. Your wingers are always less responsible in the defensive end than your center is. Your center always has to be way more responsible because he's playing the middle of the ice between the hash marks to the goal line. How much do you want to handcuff Nate by putting a foreign Rakowski, who's never skated North American ice, with Cross Hannes? Okay. <laughs> I get the point. Cross the record. Record happening Off here. the record. Off the, get... record. the first guy I'm going to meet tomorrow is going to be Cross Hannes, right? <laughs> 100%. He's going to hopefully just... <laughs> Cross check you, yeah. like I welcome it. That's what I said off the record. If Cross is listening, he he's welcome to hit. Like that's why I have him there, Travis, is because he just hasn't been able to one stay healthy and he hasn't been able to perform where they have put him. He was a first line. I think the first season we were season ticket holders. Cross was the first line winger. There was a lot the of whole potential. team was trash that year. Like admittedly, the team knows it too. Like they were not good. And Cross had this breakout party before his injury and then never was able to really bounce back. Um, I mean, you guys go back. We go back to the too early to predict episode. I put Cross in Toledo. Yeah. I didn't even put him on the roster. I'm still sitting here waiting for my objection turn. And my objection is that he's the odd man out and Alexander Doucette is in the lineup. It's time to see what this kid can do. But if I'm putting him in the lineup, he's going on the fourth line still. That's you just yeah, have them you, flipped. Deuce and I have cross. cross and deuce flipped. Yeah. Trap. That's what I personally have, but I, I'm, I'm not going to say it's a bad idea. Like, well, you said you want balance too. So if you put all the aggressive on the fourth line, you're not really balancing. Yeah. But what, is Brandon, the- what did Brandon Hawkins tell us about Alexander Doucette? A lot of things. He's a pain in the ass to play against. He's strong, strong, extremely gritty. Battles hard. Goes to the corners hard. Stitch incoming. <laughs> yeah, right. So I'll just find that part of the interview and stitch that there. But okay, so I think you can just, for argument's sake, because we could sit here all night and just turn this into another. We could debacle. Could um, I like debacles. Debacles are you, not fun to edit, though. I. I is, which is why we're re-recording this. Um, <laughs> I just I would just leave Hunter in the third line and then coin flip, cross, and do set myself. 
Is this legal? Can we put Deuce and Cross in the same? Can we go thirteen? Them? Can we go thirteen and five? Oh God! <laughs> You've seen eleven and seven, but have you seen thirteen and five before? We could do it with the talent we have on the defense now. We could. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. I'll say for opening night, I'll leave Cross in. Cross has to prove himself this year. He knows this is a prove-it year. He showed glimpses of improvement in training camp and some preseason action, too. We did see some better action there from him. Nick, you said it. The kid was the most unlucky kid last year. He hit more crossbars than any other player I've ever seen. That luck has to go away. That bad luck has to go away at some point, right? You'd think, but who knows? I I think Dan's going to put him in the lineup. He's going to be on a short leash on the fourth line. And I, I think Hunter's going to get that opportunity to go out there and play with Nate and Rakowski. I, I, I didn't show what he's got offensively, because at that point, if you can have an Austin Watson and Dominic Shine on your fourth line with rotate player in and out, we don't know who that's going to be for sure. And then you can have a two-way power forward like Hunter moving up and down in the higher parts of the lineup with all these other kids that need protection out there i like it especially when i'm thinking about a milwaukee specifically if i'm talking opening night roster followed up by a rockford team the next night you probably see the roster the same thing the both nights you want protection there there's bad blood between all three of these teams that we're speaking about they were playoff battles they rockford played us how many times last year milwaukee's been a rival for years you want the protection in the lineup and as I'm saying this, that's making more of an argument for Doucet to be in the lineup because he's so freaking strong. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think you see Cross opening night, Doucet maybe rotating in for him depending on Cross's performance opening night. But every game that Cross plays from a coaching perspective is going to be under the microscope. It's, there's going to be a ton of pressure on this kid this year. So I... I, I like Travis's idea of a shutdown line. I don't think we see that opening night. I think you see the enforcement spread out a little bit, but I think you'll eventually see that line drift together, depending on how long we have Austin Watson here. Well, you got to play Austin Watson against his former AHL team, too. You do. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, that's got a fun you, story there. You do. The argument can be made both ways, and it's funny that we spent most of the time just arguing between who's going to be the third line le- left wing or the fourth line left wing. Um, I, I, I still think there's a change to be made on defense, too, but that's just me. What? I I understand wanting to play the captain opening night. I just don't. I can't put Rafferty on the bench or on the press box with this well, production. It's, have a word with Justin Hole. I have, if, I have a word with Steve Eiserman who signed his long, expensive contract. It, I mean, it, I think it, literally you would have Rafferty in there if Hull wasn't being sent down. That, that's where he fits. Is it, though? Well, I mean, you move everybody up. You move 2-0 up with Bali and then Didier, Didier with Lagasin and then Biro with Rafferty. I mean, yes, if Hull's not there, but I don't know. The, the roster will be fluid this year. I just hope everybody... <laughs> you wanted to say fluid one more time, didn't you? I hope everybody understands that. Yeah, I mean, it's it so be a hard. Good team. It's so hard because Rafferty played one more game than did last year, too. Just one more. They were used pretty equally. So, so sure. We'll just, instead of extending the episode another 20 minutes arguing about that, we'll leave Dids in. That's fine. Are you guys sure Coast is going to be the starting goalie, though? Yeah, that 100%. There's no doubt sus. in my mind there. No, that's the that was the easiest part of this whole lineup. Overall, when I look at this roster on paper, it's really exciting. The offensive upside here is astronomically higher, I think, than last year. Defensively, it's going to be interesting to watch. But when you talk about the veteran additions that they made that can score, as long as they live up to their potential, it's going to be a high scoring season for us defensively. It's going to be interesting to watch, but having the Justin hole and William Lagason, which five weeks ago, we didn't know if we were going to have both of them, let alone one of them, I think is ease our minds there. And you have easily one of the best defensive forward prospects in hockey right now at center in Nate Danielson. So defensively, it's going to be fun to watch, but offensively, and there's some grit, there's some sandpaper to this team that we had a little bit of last year, but 
it wasn't as up and down the lineup as you, you saw it. You know, Carter Mazur can throw the body. He can throw his weight around. Marco Casper, we know what he's capable of to piss people off. Hunter, <laughs> we know what he's capable of. Austin Watson is a bona fide enforcer. Dominic Shine can throw him when he needs to, but I think he wants to move away from that and really show his offensive skill. And we saw a lot of that last year. And then you look at the blue line as well. Tuo loves to throw the body, especially after he gets hit. He, his eyes turn red and he goes after the guy immediately. Vero, he's got that dog in him. And Didier leads by example. You touch one of the, the players, he's going to make your life a living hell. And Sebastian Coso will come after you if you poke him. So and we'll stupid will too. Yeah. <laughs> so the team's got some grit. It's got the potential to be offensively fantastic. Let us know in the comments of the video. How close do you think we got? Or when you actually see the lineup come out and it's nowhere near close, feel free to clown us too. We'll, yeah. we'll accept it either way. But Just tag Brandon. I had nothing to do with this. <laughs> you definitely were a third of the conversation. Travis. <laughs> <laughs> but before we wrap up, boys, you know, because we've already hinted at this might have been re-recorded this segment because uh, last night was way too late at night. The Griffins announced something that we knew about for a little bit here but couldn't talk about. But they dropped it today, and Vandal Arena finally got a new scoreboard. I had to put something in here quick about this. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. It's massive. And just like everybody else agreed to watch replays when you're sitting in your seats, unless you're at the far end, you're not going to have to crane your neck anymore to watch the replay happen. So I'm excited. I'm really excited to see what the team does with it, with fan engagement, being able to maybe see replays live in action, kind of like they do at Little Caesars Arena. I would be really happy to see that as long as they don't do that to the flow TV feed at the same time. That'll be the only thing that drives me nuts, but much needed upgrade. And we're really excited about it. It looks gigantic in pictures. I hope it's as big in person. I'm so excited to see it. I want to know what the engagement's going to be like. I don't even remember the old scoreboard to be honest with you. I know you guys all do because you've you lived there for 20 something years, Brandon. So um, I'm excited for it. It looks crisp. It looks clean. And it. <laughs> we, we, I mean, I saw you today, Brandon. And you're like, there's only two. And I'm like, ah, OK, whatever. <laughs> but it's going to be four. Oh, that video they shared after yeah. the first picture I made mean, it look so much better. The first so, picture was like, it looks like they were still unwrapping it. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's what it was, too. So I, I think so. But. Either way, a welcomed upgrade. Oh, yeah. Now I'm excited for what's going to be next year. We got this year, we got new jerseys. We've got, we did get a new logo, which that's not going to change. Or like center ice thing. That's going to stay the same. Oh, that definitely needs to stay the same. I like our center ice thing. So I'm wondering what next year's upgrades are going to be. Concessions? Hopefully. That would be nice. Everybody did a nice job updating that. I was going to say, everybody's getting new stuff this year. We got new boards and glass and dashers. And yeah. So you guys you. got a new scoreboard, and we're all we're growing up together. In the you know the first, league. you know the first time we sit down with Hawkins before the season starts, or when the season starts for the walleye, the first question would be, "Are you to be the first? Were you the first one to mark up the new glass?" Because you know he was. Like, there's no doubt in my mind. He ripped a shot right off it to leave a big old puck mark. Yeah, he probably broke a piece of glass on the first shot. Probably already. <laughs> but yeah, had to make sure we threw that piece about the upgrade in there. We're excited. Boys, opening night is here. It is Friday. We are excited. I'm not going to be there, which I'm sad about. I will be in Denver, Colorado for a wedding, which will be a lot of fun. But you guys will both be in the building. Travis, you'll be in the seats. Nick, you'll be in a new location this year. I'll, I'll be in the nest. You'll be in the press box. <laughs> oh, that's what which, we call it. <laughs> yeah, press, but they should call it the nest. Don't know why they don't. That'd be kind of cool. Um, but yeah, no, we're excited that. We have that opportunity this season. So for those that don't know, because we haven't said it, we're credentialed media with the Grand Rapids Griffins this year. So a huge shout out to the Grand Rapids Griffins for making that even a possibility and accepting podcast as media. And for everybody else, it's going to help us bring a whole new level of content to you guys. We made sure to strategically throw some stuff together in the off season. So we are prepared and won't look like fools, but be able to bring you guys high quality content, some post game interviews, and maybe some updates during games, too, from the arena, from the both of us. So we're excited. Nick will be up there. Like I said, Trav will be around the arena. So if you see him, ask for stickers. He'll have some. We'll bring our new new stickers for the year with us. And uh, 
I'm excited to get back there the following weekend for the back-to-back Friday, Saturday games. I'm that's, that's my home opener. So I'm ready, but it's a good time to end this episode here. Cause this is a long one, but the season preview deserves to be long. So hopefully you enjoy this. Hopefully you listen to it on the way to the arena tonight, but to wrap this up, we got to thank everyone. So first, thank you to Ryan Hanna for jumping on the show again. We appreciate you. That was a lot of fun for us. We look forward to doing more in the future. Thank you to the sponsors of the show, DraftKings and Game Time, as well as the Hockey Podcast Network for securing a new sponsor, which is Game Time. So thank you guys for that. And of course, the longstanding primary sponsor of the show, Everything Hockey. Make sure you head over to everythinghockey.com. Use code WEST to save a few bucks off your order. But without the sponsors, also without the Patreon members, the show wouldn't be possible. And our new Patreon members are... We've got Randy, Derek, Lori, Allen, and Michael Sate back for season two with Randy for season two as well. So hop on over there. There'll be some uh, crazy clips and extras and edits. And I don't know what else we've got out there. More it's Phil. The only, it's the only place Nick has unrestricted access to upload things without my approval. So, uh, yeah, head over there and subscribe. <laughs> Patreon.com slash Hockey Town West Podcast. You won't want to miss it. It'll be a fun one. A lot of the post game stuff will go up there first before anyone else gets to see it. So definitely head over there and check it out. And to those that have already subscribed, we appreciate you. But boys, hockey's back. I'm happy. We're all happy. Let's go, Griffins. Go, Walleye. Love you. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to the Hockey Town West Podcast. Be sure to check us out on Twitter at HockeyTownWPod and your host, Nick at GR Hockey Guy and Brandon at Brandon GR Hockey.